Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield topics that crop up for child presenting with a mass for medical school final exams. So just a little bit about the medicine guide. The medicine guide is aimed to support medical students throughout their entire journey at medical school. So I've made a series focusing on helping you to become successful at medical school. So it includes videos such as how to be successful in the pre-clinical years at medical school, how to be successful during the clinical years at medical school, how to make the most out of your GP placements, how to be as successful as you can, how to get the most out of your hospital placements, how to succeed in your clinical OSCEs. Also, I've made a series dedicated to high yield paediatric topics, such as the high yield congenital heart disease for finals, high yield rashes for finals, high yield limping child for finals, high yield genetic conditions for finals, high yield vomiting child for finals. So if you enjoy my video today, then please can I ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please like my video, please share with your friends, and if you can, please post in the comment section below. So without further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that I'm going to be focusing upon these core topics which crop up time and time again in final exams, such as necrotizing enterocolitis, intussusception, pyloric stenosis, acute appendicitis, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, neuroblastoma and nephroblastoma, or it can be known sometimes as a Wilms tumour. Okay. So necrotizing enterocolitis describes inflammation, necrosis and perforation in different parts of the bowel. So the risk factors of necrotizing enterocolitis, the major risk factor is prematurity. So necrotizing enterocolitis is only found essentially in, in premature babies, so neonates. So the child will present with abdominal distension and obvious abdominal pain, bile stained vomiting, bloody diarrhea, so it might be described as hematochesia in the nappy sometimes or uh, blood specked stools and the child will be obviously shocked. In terms of tests, we do an abdominal x-ray to show bowel wall edema, pneumatosis intestinalis and sometimes a neuroperitoneum may be present if there's any degree of perforation. Okay, and I've got an abdominal x-ray in the bottom right hand corner and hopefully you can appreciate these features in there. So in terms of the management, we need to stop any oral feeds, give an NG tube for decompression, offer broad spectrum antibiotics and ultimately perform a laparotomy. So the broad spectrum antibiotics typically will vary uh, between hospitals, so please follow your local hospital guidelines. But as far as I know, the most typical broad spectrum antibiotics which are given to treat necrotizing enterocolitis is cefotaxim and vancomycin. Okay. So interception is where you've got telescoping of a proximal segment of the bowel into the distal segment. So if you have a look at the far left picture you can see how there's a little bit of telescoping present there okay so let's have a look at the risk factors so risk factors involves Burkitt lymphoma viral infection and intestinal malrotation so with a viral infection it's alluding to the fact that it's theorized that a viral infection will enlarge the pace patch and this acts as the leading point which then promotes that telescoping structure to develop and ultimately lead to interception to occur. Okay. So in terms of the signs, so the child will complain of a colicky abdominal pain with pallor. There'll be an obvious sausage-like mass palpable in the right iliac fossa, bilious vomiting, and classically red current jelly-like stools and that's going to be your very classic description and that will without a doubt crop up in your exam so please please be aware of that. Another sign which is classic of interception is that a child will draw up their knees to their chest 
Again, that helps to emphasize that they're in excruciating pain. In terms of tests, we did full blood count, a CBG, so that's a capillary blood gas. We need to do an abdominal ultrasound scan to confirm that the child is suffering from interception. So this will present as a target sign or perhaps the donut sign. So if you have a look at the bottom left picture, it's got an example of a target sign identified during an ultrasound. And then if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you've got an example of a CT scan showing a bullseye and you've got the red arrow pointing directly to the bullseye. So these are very classic buzzwords which you'll find in your SBA and hopefully you can tick intersusception from the option list and then move on to the next question with confidence. Okay. So in terms of the management, we resuscitate patients with IV fluids and blood products because they're more likely to be dehydrated, offer them IV antibiotics, and the definitive treatment is a rectal air insufflation. So this is a radiological procedure where reduction is performed to help push out that leading part. Okay. So pyloric stenosis arises from hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the pyloric muscles. So it's typically found in children aged between two weeks up until two months. So the child will have projectile non-bilious vomiting. There will be a palpable olive-like mass found in the right upper quadrant or the epigastric region. So doctors can perform a test feed as part of investigating for this condition. So after giving the baby a little bit of milk to drink, the baby will have visible waves of gastric peristalsis radiating across the abdomen. You can perform a CBG, a capillary blood gas, to show a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. So please remember that because that will definitely crop up in your exam. So it's very important. And when you do an ultrasound, it shows a thickened pyloric muscle. So if you have a look at the top and second most top picture in the right upper quadrant, it shows that hyperplasia of the pyloric muscle and the second picture in particular shows an ultrasound scan showing that thickened pyloric muscle. So again, that's quite key to remember. And in terms of management, we ensure that patients are nil by mouth. We do an NG tube decompression. And the surgical intervention is the definitive management of pyloric stenosis. So we need to perform Ramstead's pyloromyotomy. Apologies again for mispronouncing that. It's a bit of a tongue twister. But that's something that you do need to be aware of for your exams. You need to know the name of the surgical procedure. There's not many conditions at medical school level where you need to know the surgical names, um, but pyloric stenosis uh, you do need to know the name of the surgery needed to operate on it. So essentially, if you have a look at the bottom right hand picture, there's a, a longitudinal incision which is made and it's just opening up another way to help divert some of the food passed into the pylorus and then into the duodenum and it helps to prevent any further projectile vomiting, okay? So acute appendicitis. So children will typically present with abdominal pain initially around the umbilical area, which then radiates the right iliac fossa. The abdominal pain will increase the movement. So it might describe that the child can't hop on their right leg because of their excruciating abdominal pain might be a bit of mild fever and also Rothschild sign is something that can be elicited during an abdominal examination. So this is when the doctor is palpating the left iliac fossa and the child complains of pain in the right iliac fossa. So that's an example of Rothschild sign and that's typically found in appendicitis. So it's normally a clinical diagnosis, but we can do an ultrasound scan if we're suspecting perhaps an abscess. 
And in terms of management, the child is still by mouth and we give IV fluids to stop the child from becoming dehydrated. And we need to perform a diagnostic laparotomy. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia, so ALL, is the most common paediatric leukemia. So risk factors involves Down syndrome and even more so the Philadelphia chromosome T922. So that's something that you definitely need to know because it crops up quite often in exams. And if you're aware of the Philadelphia chromosome association with ALL, then hopefully it will make your life a little bit easier and you'll gain the higher marks. So a child will present with bleeding, bruising, petechiae. They will experience hepatomegaly, so that will be your palpable abdominal mass in the right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant regions. And also there'll be some meningeal involvement, so they'll complain of headaches, neck stiffness and cranial nerve palsies. In terms of test, a peripheral blood film and a bone marrow aspirate is diagnostic and more than 20% of lymphoblasts are present. And in terms of management, we need to immediately refer children who are presenting with unexplained petechiae or hepatosplenomegaly. Okay. So neuroblastoma is a tumour which commonly arises from the neurocrest cells of the adrenal medulla, most commonly, and also it can also arise from the sympathetic nervous system. So it typically presents as an abdominal mass which crosses the midline. A blueberry muffin rash, so if you have a look at the picture in the bottom left hand corner, that's an example of a blueberry muffin rash. The child will also have a short stature and appear underweight, and they will experience periorbital ecchymosis, so that almost looks similar to a raccoon eye appearance. And they will also experience opsomyoclonus, so jerky eye movements. Which looks, as though, which looks as though they're dancing. And in terms of tests, we need to perform urinary catecholamines, which are elevated. So VMA and HVA are examples of urinary catecholamines, and these are elevated in neuroblastoma. In terms of management, we offer surgical management, and this can be followed up by radiochemotherapy. Okay. So now I'm going to be focusing on a nephroblastoma or a Wilms tumour. So children will present with a painless palpable unilateral mass which doesn't cross the midline and this is a key feature which can help you discriminate between a Wilms tumour and nephroblastoma and on the previous slide when we were discussing a neuroblastoma. The child will also suffer from painless hematuria and hypertension. So I forgot to mention that nephroblastoma or Wilms tumour is essentially a tumour in the kidneys. Okay. So in terms of tests we need to do a renal biopsy because obviously the, the renal system is involved and this will present classically as an area of necrosis or blastomatous tissues resembling metanephric blastema and also epithelial tubules will be present. So please remember those key phrases because they'll be used as part of the diagnostic workup for Wilms tumour. And we can perform a full blood count and this presents with anemia. So in terms of management, we perform a nephrectomy, so that's where we remove either that affected region or we just remove the kidney in general, depending on how advanced the tumour has grown and then offer post-operative chemotherapy. So I just wanted to say thank you for staying with me. I appreciate it has been quite a long video. Uh, thank you for watching my video today. If you've enjoyed my video then please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please give me a thumbs up and please share this video with all of your friends. So thank you very much for listening and I wish you all the best for your exams. Thank you.